Hello everyone. Today we'll be looking at a uh, little more detail at Bohr's atomic model, which he used to describe uh, the structure of the hydrogen atom. Unfortunately, he couldn't really extend it to bigger atoms, but it was still pretty good. It was the first uh, model to ever use quantum physics. So, without further ado, let's get started. So Bohr's 1912 model used a radical new quantum physics, which was still, which was still pretty controversial at the time, to explain uh, spectral lines. So it was the first time quantum physics was ever used with a sort of actual real application other than explaining blackbody radiation. And in fact, the first time it was used to describe particles like electrons instead of just packets of energy. The model consisted of three main postulates, all of which were pretty uh, crazy at the time, but all worked really well together to explain the spectrum of hydrogen. So the first and biggest postulate is that electrons can only occupy certain energy states. They're not just orbiting around a nucleus, but they have to be at certain uh, energies around the nucleus. They can't be anywhere in between. And that's sort of the main quantum physics-y bit. So the electrons around the nucleus do not radiate energy, as classical physics would have them do, but instead they're sort of uh, stuck at each state. They can't move in between. So electrons in different orbits have different energies. So the lowest orbit will have the lowest energy and it won't be able to spiral inwards and it won't be able to spiral outwards. It can only jump. So Bohr's second postulate uh, defines what these allowed energy states were. So we have energy level 1, 2, 3, 4 and so on. So the equation he came up with was this one here. MVR, which is the angular momentum of the electron, equals NH over 2 pi. So MVR is the electron's angular momentum. Fairly important. This is sometimes known as the rule of quantized angular momentum. And the integer N on the right side of the equation is called the electron's principal quantum number. It corresponds to the energy level of that electron. We can see that there are a few other letters in here, so I'll just quickly go through them. H is Planck's constant, which you should be familiar with by now. Uh, pi is the circle number, you know, 3.14-ish. And so this means that the energy level, sorry, the, the quantum number of the bottom energy level is 1. And so the angular momentum here will be given by this expression. So this will be h over 2 pi. This will be 2h over 2 pi, and so on and so forth. Now at first, the units might look a little odd here. Because you think, hang on. Integers and constants like pi don't have units. But Planck's constant is in joule seconds. How does that work when angular momentum is given by this equation, which is kilograms meters per second uh, times meters? Well, it turns out that one joule is the same as one kilogram meter squared per second squared. And so if we multiply this by another second, then it'll match up exactly uh, with this expression here. So that means that although they at first look different, the units on both sides are equivalent, which is pretty important when we are making a new physical law. So Bohr's third postulate, we're still in the postulates, explains the spectral lines of atoms. And this is what allows electrons to jump between energy levels. The postulate says that when electrons change their energy level, they absorb or emit a photon. If they go from a high energy level to a low energy level, they emit a photon of energy. If they go from a low energy level to a high energy level, they can only do it if they first absorb a photon of energy. They sort of make this jump, as you can see. So the energy change is equal to the energy of the photon. Makes sense, right? But you need to write these things down if you're making a whole new theory.
So we can see that the change in energy, which is the final energy state minus the initial energy state, will be equal to the energy of the photon, HF. So this was the first model that could successfully describe uh, the spectral lines of hydrogen, which is pretty good because up until that point they were a little bit of a mystery. It was also the first model that used quantum physics to describe some aspects of the atom. The thing before that had been using classical physics. The model still had a number of flaws and problems. It was a big step forward, especially for using quantum physics to model the real world, but it was far from perfect. So to begin with, we had the, uh, this odd little thing that we call hyperfine lines. So very, very careful observation of some spectral lines show that they were actually more than one line. They were just really, 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 really close together. And Bohr's model could not account for that at all. So these are called the hyperfine lines. They're found in lots of different spectra. And Bohr's model didn't have any reason for this to happen. I mean, you, you know the model now. You, you, there's no way that this model could explain a phenomenon like this. Another uh, problem was the Zeeman effect. So it turns out that a strong magnetic field, I'm talking really, really strong, like magnetic fields at the surface of the sun, uh, can alter the spectrum of an element. It can cause some spectral lines to split into multiple lines, which we can see in this uh, photograph over here. This is, in fact, uh, spectral lines near a sunspot on the sun. As it turns out, sunspots are caused by very, very strong magnetic fields. And that's why we're able to see the Zeeman effect produced. Uh, it's called the Zeeman effect because it was first uh, discovered or described by a guy called Zeeman. And as we can see, Bohr's model can't account for that at all. There's no way for it to describe a splitting of the spectral lines that we can see in this photograph. Uh, it also couldn't predict the spectrum of elements other than hydrogen, which is a bit of a drawback. And it couldn't explain why some spectral lines are brighter than others. Like electrons like to make those jumps more often than they like to make the other jumps. So it could explain why the lines were there. It couldn't explain why some were brighter than others. And finally, it's a mix of classical and quantum physics. You have electrons going around a nucleus with electrostatic force, but they've also got quantized energy and angular momentum, and it doesn't really work out too well. So while indeed it was a very big step forward and a great achievement for quantum physics, uh, it still had a while to go. So that's the theory. We've gone through the Bohr atom and some of the postulates that Bohr made, as well as some of the advantages and disadvantages of the uh, model that Bohr made. So on to some questions. Question six. Why did Bohr state that electrons in stable orbits did not emit electromagnetic radiation? Because uh, we know from our classical physics, of course, that accelerating charges do emit radiation. So we have a few options here. Uh, because it didn't fit in with the idea of quanta, because the orbits were assumed to be circular, because normal atoms did not emit electromagnetic radiation, or because energy was emitted when the electrons changed energy levels. Now it turns out all of these, except for one, rely on an assumption. So Bohr started with observations, not assumptions, and he built an empirical model. An empirical model is a model that describes something about the world without having a good understanding of exactly what's happening, without having a good theoretical understanding. So it, it was able to successfully explain the uh, spectral lines of hydrogen, but Bohr didn't know why. So we can't say it didn't fit in with the idea of quanta because he was using quanta to try and explain this effect. We can't say it's because the orbits were assumed to be circular because we're not assuming anything. We're trying to just explain the spectral lines. We can't say because energy was emitted with electrons changed energy levels because that's a, a consequence of the model and not a reason for it. In fact, the only correct answer here is C. Normal atoms do not emit electromagnetic radiation. Bohr noticed, of course, that atoms don't do that. And so he assumed that for some reason, didn't know why, the electrons were not emitting any electromagnetic radiation. 
Question 7. What weakness did the Rutherford and Bohr models both have? Remember that the Rutherford model has a, a number of electrons orbiting a nucleus, a little bit like a solar system. So we have a few options here. Let's start at the bottom and work our way to the top. D. Neither could explain how quanta apply to the model. Now it's true that Rutherford's model couldn't do this, it was completely classical, but Bohr's model did use quanta to explain the different energy levels of the electrons, so it's not D. How about C? Neither could explain atomic spectra. Well, once again, Rutherford's model couldn't do that, but Bohr's could. B. They both only worked for hydrogen. Now, this is one of the big shortcomings of Bohr's model. It couldn't explain heavier atoms. But Rutherford's model uh, could explain any sort of atom. It's just a big heavy nucleus in the middle with electrons going around the outside. And in fact, he came up with this model uh, after he was bombarding gold atoms, and he noticed that the nucleus was doing something odd. So in fact, Rutherford's model works for uh, all the elements, but Bohr's does not. B is not the correct answer, though, because it works for Rutherford's model. Our last option then is A, neither could account for stable electron orbits. And in fact, this is the correct answer. Both Rutherford and Bohr knew that the electron orbits had to be stable somehow, but they couldn't explain exactly why that was. Question 8. What is an emission spectrum? Now, an emission spectrum is uh, colorful lines on a black background, right? So how do we get that from Bohr's model? Well, an element's emission spectrum is a unique collection of wavelengths uh, emitted by excited atoms of that element. We excite the atoms, they glow. That's how we get fluorescent lighting. So how does Bohr's atomic model account for emission spectra? And here's the important question. So the answer here has to do with the energy levels of the electrons. Bohr's model states that the electrons of an atom emit photons when they move between energy levels. So electrons of each element uh, are only stable at certain energy levels, and this is why they can only emit certain photons, because they go from one certain energy level to a different certain energy level. Question 9. What is the Zeeman effect? So I'll let you think for a moment. Uh, the correct answer is that uh, it's the splitting of spectral lines under a magnetic field. So under a very, very powerful magnetic field, uh, the spectral lines of elements like hydrogen will in fact split into more than one line. All right, so part B, how does Bohr's atomic model account for this effect? So I'll give you a moment to think about that. And the answer is, it cannot. Bohr's atomic model has no way at all to account for the splitting of the spectral lines. It's a very unusual effect, and of course it's what led Bohr's model to be improved upon later on. Finally, question 10. It's a bit of a long one. In Bohr's model of the atom, the angular momentum of electrons is quantized according to this equation. What are the three lowest possible values for an electron's angular momentum? So remember, the angular momentum of the electron is this thing over here. So if we want to find the lowest three values, we want to have this thing being the lowest it can possibly be. Can't change h, can't change pi, can't change 2. We can change n. So, we'll start off with n equals 1. That's the lowest we can get for this equation. So, at n equals 1, the angular momentum equals nh over 2 pi. Makes sense, right? So substitute n equals 1, uh, substitute h equals 6.626 times whatever, uh, and 2 pi, our calculator knows how to do pi. And so that'll give us uh, about 1 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. Okay, so that's n equals 1. Next one, n equals 2. At n equals 2, substitute n over here. So we get uh, our equation, of course equals 2 times Planck's constant over 2 pi. That gives us 2.1 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. All right, last one. Can you guess what it is? <laughs> yeah, it's n equals 3. So uh, with our equation as before, we now take the 3 
stick it into the n, and we end up with 3 times Planck's constant over 2 pi. Put this into a calculator, and we end up with 3.164 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. And so the angular momentum of an electron in a hydrogen atom cannot take any other values aside from here if it's uh, below this value. If it wants to change its angular momentum, it can only do so by hopping up an energy level. Well, that's the end of the questions. And in fact, I think you'll find that's the end of the lesson too. So in this lesson, we've covered Bohr's model and the uh, atomic spectrum of hydrogen and how Balmer's equation and Bohr's model are able to describe uh, the atomic spectrum of hydrogen. We've also gone through some of the shortcomings of Bohr's model. Thank you.